Hello, uh, good to see everyone again on uh, camera, but I, I know uh, hopefully soon we'll be doing our full-length sermons in person. Today I'd like to talk to you about the, uh, the final lesson to wrap up what has been our yearly theme. If you've been listening to our sermons online or you've been part of our church attending in person, you know that we've been uh, in our Bible readings, our Bible classes, in our Bible writing plan, and in our sermons as well, I've been talking about the theme of working together with God to build his kingdom. Now, uh, this theme came from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it started with uh, a quote that comes from Paul's writing there in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. It's an amazing concept that we get to be fellow workers with God, and the fact that we get to build with him on his greatest building project of all time. In January, we talked about God as the master builder. Certainly, he's the greatest builder that's ever been known, that ever will be. Uh, we talked about in February the idea of laying, uh, building upon God's foundation. We can't make up our own foundation. He has set the standard. It, he guides the building process based on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the chief cornerstone, cornerstone of course, being Jesus Christ himself. And throughout the months, uh, the other months of the year, whether it be in person or virtually, we've talked about Caleb and Noah and the people who built the tabernacle and David and Josiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra, Nehemiah. Finally, we talked about the returning captives, how each and every one of them, even the, the commoners and uh, the amateurs, as you might say, they all had a part in building the kingdom, uh, building you know, walls, building temples, just all sorts of building projects uh, and the lessons we learned from those. But the uh, original theme of the year is us working with God to build the kingdom. And so that is maybe to us, it seems like the most unlikely of builders in the Bible, but us, we are fellow builders with God. So that's the lesson we're going to talk about today, us building with God. Where do Christians fit into this plan? So, of course, we talked about how uh, God is that uh, master builder. I'd like to go back to our theme chapter for the year, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and read some of the verses that we started the year with and make some observations about us as we are building with God to help us get our emphasis right, to, to put a focus where it matters most. Uh, I'd actually like to start in the very beginning of that chapter and read the whole thing. I know it's a longer uh, reading than sometimes I do, but it gives us the context. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, when you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not fleshly, you are not walking like mere men. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, you are, not, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, servants through whom you believed? Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building." According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show, what it, be, uh, will show it because it is to be revealed with fire." And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so far as, uh, yet as through fire. Do you not know you are a spiritual temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Uh, So, like I said, it's a little bit of a longer reading, but there we get the context. Number one, why was he writing? He was writing to a group of people that were bickering. The Corinthians were not known for their unity. They were known for a a spirit of partisanship. Uh, In fact, I think that's a a sobering lesson that is very relevant today. We understand that, uh, in many ways, the the modern culture is divided, uh, whether it be down the lines of uh, economics, race, politics, things like that. Uh, We understand there are great differences. Um, In this church, there were differences that people held based on who taught them the gospel. And Paul, both in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, has said that that is uh, foolish because these guys are simply men, the ones who taught you the gospel. But they're a group that has been distracted from their main purpose, which is to be working with God. Um, God has special workers like Paul and Apollos who fill certain roles, different roles, but equally valuable roles, and the Corinthians should have been filling their roles as well, but they were too busy fighting with each other. So Paul goes through and describes what his and Apollos' work is and what it looks like and essentially what all of those that teach the gospel and and share the gospel, what their work is. Um, It's the idea that uh, not only are we the building of God, but we are also adding other living stones, to, to borrow from a few different passages like First Peter and others. Uh, Ephesians 2 talks about the same idea. We, we understand that we are, are working with God to build his kingdom. The kingdom is people. We're working on ourselves. We're working on those that we bring to Christ and those that we share the gospel with. And we're trying to make a good dwelling place for the Lord. Um, so uh, there's a couple of ideas about this that are uh, really powerful and number one, think about just how amazing it is that we get to work with him. Um, it is such a blessing. He puts confidence in us. Uh, all the way back in January, I talked about uh, how, you know, we might question God's judgment. I, like, I know my heart. I, I know my mind. I know I'm flawed. Doesn't God know that? Doesn't God know I'm not perfect? Uh, we are often our own harshest critic. And if you feel that way, you feel like, wow, who am I to be part of the kingdom of God? Who am I to be sharing the gospel? I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I don't have it down. Uh, I think those kinds of thoughts can be natural, uh, but they're also not healthy. I think there's a point when we realize God saw value in me. Uh, God knew that there was a purpose. And when you see that, when you understand that God has a role for me in his plan, well, does God make mistakes? I don't believe so. God knows where I fit in. God knows I have capabilities, and he wants me. Uh, He wants me to be that fellow worker. Now, I mean, it does make it clear, what am I? God wants me, but I'm a servant. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm I'm in the kingdom, not necessarily uh, as some high and mighty. I'm not seeking to be the leadership. I'm not seeking to be the one in charge. Uh, There are men that have gone astray, you know, men and women both, trying to seek that to be the leading person. But God's kingdom is not that way. And Paul has a a good view of what he and Apollos are. You know, everyone else might say, wow, Paul's this apostle. He's a great writer, a decent speaker. Apollos, man, you want to hear his sermons. He's a great, great speaker. He just makes the gospel come alive, like all the things you'd say about a great preacher, right? He says, we aren't uh, special, like more than anybody else. We are simply servants for God's sake. And I think that's a, a good perspective, a healthy perspective for him to have. Um, notice also, I really like at least the way that my version puts it um, in verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you get believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Um, and I love the idea that uh, God is using us to give people opportunities. Um, you know, that's, that's really, it's God's business, is, is giving opportunities to do what's right, giving opportunities to obey the gospel. Um, and think about us, if we are fellow workers with God, 
Um, you know, it's not that, hey, I've got this great message. Follow me. Do things like me. Follow my church. Uh, do my pattern. No. I mean, God is giving me opportunities to share the truth with other people, to share a life-giving message with other people, to share the gospel with other people. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm the servant who's got the task to tell people. And God provides those open doors. This is reminiscent of what Paul is going to later write to the Colossians. He asks them in chapter 4 to pray that they would have opportunity, that they would have open doors, that they would have speech seasoned as if it were with salt. Um, and he's looking for those. So I guess I want to ask us, if we are servants, if we are fellow builders, if we are waterers and planters, if we are building with God, well, we've got to believe that, and then are we even looking for opportunities? It's not just, I'm going to sit here and wait around for God to bring something my way. If you haven't noticed, people aren't going out much. Um, and now it's not to say that you won't have other opportunities uh, through virtual means, through phone calls, through letter writing, things like that. Um, but I do believe that if you're not looking for opportunities, you're not going to find them. There's a lot of people who say their heart is willing, yet they aren't actively seeking to spread the good news. Uh, we're in the time of year where we are, uh, are, as a church, we always talk about goals for the year. Uh, I would like you to set some concrete goals about finding opportunities, I don't know what yours will look like. Yours might look different than mine. Uh, here's a good one, though. I will find one person each month to share the good news with. I think that's, that's an admirable trait that's doable. It's not scary. You can find one person. Um, if you are brand new and if you are super scared, you can start easy. You can just offer an invitation to... Uh, maybe tune in to one of our, our worship services, or you can pass along an email with one of our bulletin articles, or uh, send a link to our YouTube page. Find something, but I want you to, to make it a commitment to look for opportunities. Uh, he says to each one of you in Corinth that had opportunity, that heard the gospel, that I planted seeds and Apollos came behind me and he watered those seeds and they've grown. Uh, but who are we? We are servants who provide opportunities to people. Now, I will say that if for some reason I fail to do my job to spread the gospel, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a terrible thing, but it doesn't mean that everyone else is doomed. I think God's word can still thrive and grow despite me, but why not help along the plan? Why not fulfill my responsibility and uh, to, to fit in there? Uh, I think about a prophet in the Old Testament who uh, had a great opportunity and he really didn't take advantage of it, but yet he still was successful despite his own wicked heart, and, and that is Jonah. Uh, Jonah had numerous opportunities to share the gospel with those that were Gentiles, and uh, God even commanded him to do so, and many Gentiles favorably responded. They had hearts that were softened by the gospel, uh, in their case, uh, a heart of repentance uh, that led to their salvation. But even with a failure... In a prophet, the gospel still does its job, right? So if you're sitting here saying, well, I'm no good, or I could never help, or I don't know enough, or, or you know, I think you need to look for opportunities and just go for it. Uh, start small if you need to, but make a plan. Do something. God provides opportunities. We are the servant. Another point here that I think is really important is to recognize uh, what I've already talked about is our role. We might bring stones to lay them on top of the foundation or on top of the wall. We might uh, put a seed in the ground. We might put water on that seed. But what is my role? Uh, my role is simply to bring the gospel to the heart that it needs to be with, right? And bring people to Christ, the foundation. But notice something really important here, what he says in verse 7. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. So this means don't think too highly of yourself. Don't say, wow, because I uh, am so eloquent, because I'm so smart, because I know all these verses, because I am doing everything right, then therefore I'm a good person to speak the gospel. And don't think the opposite. 
I'm terrible. I don't live a perfect life. I make all these mistakes. I don't know my Bible. I'm a brand new Christian, so I can't do it. Take yourself out of the way for a moment and put credit where credit is due. Uh, so God gives us the opportunities. Take them, servant. Uh, I'm a servant too. Fellow servant. God gives us opportunities. Take them. And then number two, God causes the growth. So plant and water. Um, you know, I do a lot of gardening. You guys know that. Uh, if I see something growing and it's growing well, uh, shouldn't I give that thing every opportunity to do its best growing, right? Whether it be a flower or vegetable or fruit or something, like, it's growing. Should I just leave it to its own devices? Well, it might succeed. There are plants that, you know, do better without us occasionally. But understand that if I take care of that, if I worry about the soil and the water and the weeds, I'm going to give that chance or that plant the best chance possible to grow. But guess what? I don't cause the growth, right? Where's the power come from to make a seed turn into something that produces fruits and vegetables? Where does that power come from? It's God. And so on one hand, that can, like I said, reduce your self-importance, where, that arrogance where you think, wow, the kingdom couldn't survive without me here. By the way, if that's your attitude, get away. Run away. <laughs> um, even if it is in a, a more positive light, if you feel like, uh, wow, this church would fall apart if I didn't do what I did, and you get kind of depressed and down about that, well, you're thinking too much of yourself. The kingdom will go on without any, you know, <laughs> one person. In fact, it should. And, it, and if there's a problem, if a church falls apart, if one person goes away, right? Um, it, it's maybe a, an indication that there wasn't really a faith to begin with. Uh, so don't have that super importance, think of, thinking of yourself, but also don't sell yourself short. Um, you can't control their heart. You can't control their growth, and you can't control what the enemy does. You may teach someone the gospel, and then uh, their job takes them away from Christ, or, or their life circumstances, or uh, their faith gets shaken by a friend or family member who doubts or persecutes them. You're not in control of that. What are you in control of? Putting seed in ground and watering it. You're in control of putting one stone on top of another. You're, you're not the one who causes the growth. Uh, so don't beat yourself up if others fail. Uh, but also, uh, you know, keep working. Like, there's work to be done because you need to be out there active. Um, I think back to the end of this chapter, he talks about, yeah, you're going to suffer loss. If someone you've been working hard to teach the gospel to, and they're making good progress, but some kind of temptation or trial happens and they fall away, it's going to hurt you. And it might make you unwilling to invest again. But if you're God's fellow worker, keep building. There's more work to be done. Keep planting. There's more planting to be done. And by the way, aren't you glad that God didn't stop building the first time someone failed? God didn't stop planting the first time someone failed, did he? Adam and Eve failed in the garden. They sinned. His perfect creation. Uh, in the days of Noah, most of the world failed. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, almost everybody failed. Over and over again, that's the story. Children of Israel, Moses is there and has to stop God from wiping out the people. All these different times, you know, people were failing, but not everybody. And so understand, you know, God causes the growth, and who knows what his plan is? Who knows how he's going to cause uh, their acceptance or rejection to bring others to Christ, or to deal out uh, any sort of parts of his plan. Keep working. Don't grow so discouraged because someone else fails that you don't work anymore, because there's more seed that needs to be planted. There's more plants that need to be watered. There is more of the building to be built. So God gives us opportunities. Do the work and, and take advantage of them. God causes the growth, so go out there and give the growth every opportunity you can to succeed. And uh, one other point I want to bring out today as uh, we're talking about our lesson is understand that God gives the grace. Uh, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. So, uh, notice, I'm, I'm theming this in such a way that God does something, therefore I do something. So God gives us opportunities, so we are to go out there and serve. 
God causes the growth, so we are to go out there and plant and water. God gives us grace. He has given us good gifts that we never deserve, that we never could earn. Salvation is not something that our merits, our own work and good deeds could ever deserve. But he gives it to us anyway. Therefore, what do we do? We build, and we build carefully. I think it's really important. God gives us grace, so we get out there and build, and we build carefully. Um, so I, I want you to build. I, I want you to, to not be afraid to act. However, I do want you to be careful how you build. I want you to give your best. I want you to put the work in. So, uh, you know, earlier I was saying, don't beat yourself up about saying the right words or knowing all the right verses. However, that doesn't excuse you from ever learning. Uh, get better. Uh, learn more. Grow in your ability. And if you have a failure in the way that you've communicated the gospel, do it better next time. Uh, don't stop working, but instead find a way to reach people when you may not have been able to before. Uh, you know, God gives us grace. He gives us these good gifts, and that is the motivation. We're saved by grace. And getting a good gift you don't deserve, or a gift you didn't expect, how do you feel when that happens? Uh, this is the, the holiday season, and oftentimes I've been the recipient of gifts, and I, honestly, I feel a little guilty. I'm like, why did you spend so much money on me? Or why did you get me something so nice? All I've got is this little piddly thing that, you know, my present I got for you doesn't compare. I think those ways sometimes because to me, gift giving, really, it shows love and it shows care. And I feel so grateful when people give me gifts and I feel like I can't say thank you enough. But what does that motivate in me? When people have given to me that way, I think, man, I want to find a way I can give back. I want to find a way to reach people. And that's powerful to me. I believe grace is one of the greatest motivators to hard work that has ever existed. And Paul understood that. Uh, Paul talks about it both in uh, 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, he talks about it, or, or not 1 Corinthians 1, he talks about it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He calls himself the least of all the apostles, one untimely born. He received uh, a vision from uh, Jesus Christ himself, an appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that was what I meant to reference earlier, uh, he talks about himself as being kind of the worst of the sinners, the chiefest of sinners, and yet God showed grace to him so he could go and tell other people about God's grace. So if you're sitting here beating yourself up, I, I'm no good, I, I can't reach people, I can't talk, I, I can't speak, I don't remember my Bible verses, uh, who am I to go out and do God's work because I'm flawed deeply? God chose you, and he thinks you can do some great stuff, He's given you grace, so just grow. Get better. Every day you live on earth is a chance to, uh, to grow and get better. And I know this quote is famous, and I probably should know who it came from, uh, but there's the quote that says that you'll be the same person this time next year except for the books you read and the people you meet. Uh, and I think that, that sentiment is true, especially with what you read and what you learn, right? Right? Uh, you're going to be exactly the same person in your thinking next year. You're going to be exactly the same person in your actions next year if you've not invested time in getting to know God's Word better and digging in deeper. Uh, now, I guarantee the more you know God's Word, the better you'll get in the future at sharing the gospel. There's a friend of mine who served as an elder for many years at a local church near here, and uh, I remember sitting with him in a fishing boat one time, and he said, Jeremy, I don't know how I got here. Sometimes I sit back and marvel. Who am I to be an elder in the Lord's church? I, I just don't feel worthy uh, of such a, a great honor and responsibility. He said, if you knew me when I was in my early 30s, you would never have expected that I could grow up to be an elder someday. And he understood where he came from, and yet he didn't see it as uh, a constant state of failure where he was going to sit there and just be his immature self he saw it as an opportunity to dig into God's word, to be around people, and to grow, to serve. The only way you'll get better at service is by doing it. The only way you'll get better at teaching is by doing it. The only way you'll grow in the kingdom is by working. And so, you know, I guess think about any kind of a home construction type thing or uh, if you've ever done a project, painting or drywall or uh, working on a car. Like the first time you do stuff, you're not great at it, right? But what happens? As you practice, as you do the work, you get better at it. 
You learn it. You learn what works and what doesn't. And the next time, you don't make those same mistakes. Uh, And we will build carefully. Uh, So my three points, simple as they are, they're all based on the fact that God has done something for us or God does something for other people, and so we have a role to play. You know, God is that master builder, but we are fellow builders with him. God gives us opportunities, so we serve. God causes the growth, so we plant and water the seed, the gospel. We tell others the gospel and let it get into their heart and their mind. And God gives us grace. Uh, He gives us good gifts we didn't deserve. And instead of punishing us, he gives us salvation. And therefore, we build and we build carefully. You don't have to be a David. You don't have to be a Solomon. You don't have to be an Ezra, a Nehemiah, or or, uh, any of the other characters I talked about. You don't have to be some high and mighty, because guess what? They were servants too. Uh, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, James 5 says, right? And yet his prayer worked. Why? That implication in James 5 is that your prayer can work too. Your prayer can do amazing things too. Uh, The apostles, they were simple men, ordinary men. Most of them probably did not have a great education. Uh, Maybe the exception, perhaps, with Matthew, but uh, even on Acts 2, when the the apostles start speaking, they, they, they recognize these guys are Galileans. They are the country bumpkins. They aren't civilized uh, Jerusalem natives. And yet here they are speaking the gospel. So if God can take ordinary guys like that, guys that are... Uh, fishermen and just regular dudes, and he can take them and make them valuable in his kingdom, what can he do with you? It's a great privilege to be part of the kingdom and to be building with God in his kingdom. It's because he has shown us how. He is the master builder. He's doing that work, and he wants us to help him. There's never been a greater work undertaken in all of history. Uh, Here's one of the, uh, the struggles of technology, as my uh, camera has lost its place. I want to bring you to one last pos- passage as we uh, close today. And it may sound strange, because this is normally a passage that is taken in a negative way. But in Genesis chapter 11, we find um, one of the first great building projects of humanity. And that is the Tower of Babel. At that time, everybody spoke the same language. Everybody decided to live in the same part of the earth rather than to spread out and multiply. But uh, as God considers what happens in Babel, this is what he says. Uh, and this is Genesis eleven five. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing they purpose to do will be impossible for them. When people work together in the same way and they talk about the same things in the same way, when they are constructing the same building project, when people are united in purpose and in value and in culture, there is nothing that will be impossible for them. Now, that, that's true of sin here in Babel. But I think the same is even more so in the gospel. And in the gospel, we find that Babel has been reversed, that men and women of of every culture and diverse language can be unified in the same work, the same purpose, building with God, and nothing will be impossible. As you consider the world and you think Christianity might be being defeated, you feel like good and righteousness is, is losing out to evil and wickedness, can I guarantee you, it will not win. Because nothing will be impossible for God's people when they are united. Are you working together with God to build his kingdom? If you are a Christian, you've been baptized to wash away your sins, let me tell you, you need to get working. You need to build. You need to work as hard as you can because grace is that motivator. And God expects great things out of you. And it may be tough, and you may suffer loss along the way, but I guarantee you, the reward is worth it. He will reward us according to our labors. And if you're listening into this lesson, and you are not a Christian, you have not had your sins washed away in baptism, let me tell you that there is no greater time than now to start working with us, because if you do, you'll work on something that it cannot break down, it cannot be defeated, and it will succeed. Nothing will be impossible for us with the help of Christ. So if you're here today, in some way, 
and you're listening in and you need to do something about your soul, please find a way to let me know so I can help you to make things right with God. May God bless us as we are fellow workers with him to build his kingdom.